Hello and welcome back to the Project Management Prepcast. I'm your instructor Cornelius Fichtner and this lesson is recorded with a live audience on Facebook and YouTube. Hello everybody. Thank you so much for joining me today. Nice to have everybody back. Today we are going to take a look at more principles from that list of 12 that got introduced with the publication of the PIMBOK Guide 7th edition. So yes, this here is part two of three in which we want to review those 12 project management principles. Today we discuss, uh, first of all, holistic thinking, where we are taking a systems view approach and consider how interconnected everything is within and without our project. Uh, leadership, big topic, uh, because we call ourselves project managers often, but in truth, we need to be leading over managing. Um, when it comes to tailoring, we have to acknowledge that one size does not fit all. So we need to find the right fit for each of our projects. And last but not least, quality is free if you do it right the first time. More about that later on. Hello, Kasim. Thank you for joining us again this week. Uh, but I want to make one thing clear from the start. Uh, this lesson is not a reading, a byproduct, a derivative, whatever you want to call it, of the PIMBOK guide. While we follow the 12 principles in the same order, this lesson is based on our own content on our original research. 12 project management principles explained by experts is the article uh, which is published on our PrepCast website. In this article, we have taken the 12 principles as a starting point, and then we go above and beyond to explain them with input from a dozen experts. So yes, we are taking the principles from the PIM PIMBOK guide as our base camp, but then we climb the mountain and we go above and beyond with our original explanations, examples, contents, comments, uh, critiques, and even sample questions from our very own exam simulator. Here, is our agenda. Uh, we begin with taking a look at the PIMBOK guide and the fact that the PIMBOK guide is not the PMP exam. Uh, that is important as always, especially since we're looking at those 12 principles. And then we will do review of principles five to eight, take action and takeaways. And just like in part one of this, when we talk about those four principles, we have examples. And I want you to join me here on Facebook and YouTube and comment on what you see as additional examples that we have maybe missed. And I want you to join me when we look at the sample questions from our exam simulator. Is A, B, C, or D correct? And that is going to be your task of figuring that out and uh, giving me your letter in the, in the chat. All right. Wonderful. Uh, thank you so much, Kamar. You are doing a great job. Excellent content, as always. Much appreciated. Thank you so much. Before we get into the first of our four principles, please don't forget, we offer a complete online suite of PMP exam preparation tools, the PrepCast training course here on the left and the PrepCast simulator on the right. The PrepCast training course gives you the 35 contact hours you need and all the knowledge, skills, uh, tools, techniques, anything you want to have for the uh, PMP exam prep at pmprepcast.com and the exam simulator on the right gives you the opportunity to try out your knowledge on 2,280 exam sample questions. That number changes regularly because uh, we just, uh, at the time of recording, within the last 10 days, we added another 120 to this. So the number goes up and up and up. All right, it's at pmexamsimulator.com. As promised. First thing we have to talk about is the fact that the PMP exam is not a test of the PIMBOK guide. Instead, questions on the PMP exam are based 
on the ECO, the exam content outline. This is something that I keep preaching again and again and again. You've probably seen this slide in other presentations that I've given on the, the, the PMP exam and the PMBOK guide in particular. It's always important to come back to this and make that absolutely clear for those who have not yet understood this properly. So how does this work? Let me, let me explain this by showing you how PMI develops their exam questions. Now, this is a very high-level view. This is a bird's eye view of this is happening. We're not going to go down into the detail, but it starts with a volunteer who works for PMI, or who volunteers for PMI, rather, deciding on a topic. I want to create a PMP exam sample question on a particular topic. So they open up the exam content outline and pick that topic from within, and then they develop a question based on that topic. Note, they don't open the PMBOK guide. They don't open any of the, uh, of, of the reference books yet. No, they start with the exam content outline and say, these are all the tasks, these are all the enablers, these are the domains that I, as a question, item developer, as PMI calls them, the, an item developer, this is what I need to start with. This is my, my starting point, the exam content outline. Then based on that, a question is developed with four answers and the developer then decides and says, yeah, B is correct. Now comes the important bit. At this point, the developer has to go into the 10 reference books there at the bottom right and define why, which of these 10 reference books confirms that B is correct. That is a very important step. So the developer has to find one out of those 10 reference books and say, here we go, this is the correct answer. And the reason is because one of our 10 reference books says so. This then goes through a quality review and then a quality reviewer once again goes into those 10 reference books and says, oh yeah, I have found a second reference book that confirms that B is indeed the correct answer. Now, important thing to note here, the PMBOK guide is just one out of these 10. So it's quite possible that a question that is on the PMP exam is not referenced to the PMBOK guide. Very likely, for example, if it's an agile question, then it's probably the agile uh, practice guide and one of the other agile books on the reference list. So very important to understand this and accept this. The PMBOK guide is just one of 10 reference books for the PMP exam. And uh, yeah, it's quite possible that you come across questions that don't reference the PMBOK guide at all, both on the real PMP exam and both in our exam simulator, because we follow exactly this approach here. That much said, let's jump into our four principles of today, which come obviously from the PMBOK guide. So we have these four principles and number five is holistic thinking. This is where we are taking a systems view approach because our projects are complex. They integrate into the world. They integrate within themselves. If you tweak something here, oh, somewhere else, something might actually break. So what is this all about? This principle does remind us that the projects we work on are usually embedded in a much larger system and that what we do may affect everything around our project as well as everything within the project, right? Nothing is isolated and everything is connected. We need to look at and understand the system as a whole. If you change something in the system today that you think is a good idea, maybe down the road, you'll have users come back to you who don't understand that particular change that you have made. And suddenly your support need after it's been launched goes up drastically, right? So as a, as a simple example there, that is systems thinking. So you do something or you think about your system today. It is the ability to think 
of the entire system, the individual parts, behavior of the system, and the relationships over time. So you are able to see both the trees and the forests, uh, the, the trees and the forest at the same time. And that, that's an important thing, right? You see the individual trees, you know, usually as the project manager, project leader, we, we understand our projects integrately, so we know all the, the various trees. But at the same time, we're able to step back, we're able to look at this holistically, understand how all of this fits and how it fits into the world surrounding us. The benefit of uh, utilizing systems thinking is that it provides us a holistic view of the system, which can help us understand the dynamics within the system and without the system. As always, we have reached out to an expert, and this expert is Shane Drum from shanedrum.com, uh, and he turned it on his head, and he said the opposite of system thinking is approaching a problem from a single point of view by looking at the individual parts instead of the whole. So imagine if you did only that, if you looked only at the individual bits and pieces, the trees, and you don't try to understand how these, these fit together and how the whole thing fits in. That is going to leave you probably with a big mess there. So. Because you're looking at all of this from a bird's eye view, represented here in looking at a, a, a motorway interchange, you will be able to raise questions and see opportunities that aren't typically seen when elements of your project are viewed individually. This gives you a new perspective and it ultimately leads to better designed products, services, and policies, right? And you can very well see how not doing this might might lead to you not seeing stuff, not being able to implement the best possible solution or or suddenly seeing interconnections and 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 realizing, oh, if we did this, then that would happen, and that would be a good thing, wouldn't it? right? So thinking in systems will help us project managers reduce waste and save money by foreseeing the impact of decisions on the entire system, uh, Shane says. And we can then utilize different system thinking techniques depending on the issue at hand. I see a question that's come in from a Tony uh, Tony Pony, what are the 10 references we talked about earlier? Uh, these 10 references are on the PMI uh, website. And uh, thanks to my colleague, uh, Shannon, who is on the call here with me, you can find these reference guide lists here, pmprepcast.com slash pmp hyphen reference hyphen list. That's just a forwarding link that we have for you there. All right, so you can use different types of techniques. What are these techniques? I have three examples. Well, I actually have I have seven examples for you, but the three will go a little bit more into detail. So we start with rich pictures. Rich pictures, you see an example here on the right. These are part of the soft systems methodology, and these provide a mechanism for learning about complex or, or maybe badly defined problems, well, by drawing a detailed picture, a rich picture. And that's a representation of your system. Uh, typically, these follow no commonly agreed syntax. They consist of symbols, sketches, doodles, and, and they can contain as much pictorial information as is deemed necessary. The example that we have here on the screen, this comes from a police statement request process. So how does the police, or in this case, probably a sample, how does a statement get taken from a witness uh, during a police inquiry? And you can see how this person here drew this out very well. And you have the receptionist and doctors and police and the court. And so you really draw a picture of things and, and show how everything, uh, you know, fits together. And then on the right side, we have the causal loop diagrams. This is a snapshot of all relationships that matter. Kind of looks like a mind map uh, a little bit, doesn't it? 
It is a visual representation of key variables, factors, issues, processes, and how they are interconnected. You also see that at the bottom there, you see that orange uh, link going from the orange side suddenly over to the yellow side. And so, you know, you, everything is interconnected, right? Yes. At, at these diagrams, they show these variables represented as text and the causal relationship between them represented as arrows. So maybe not necessarily a mind map, because in mind maps, you just have lines. You usually don't draw arrows. Uh, unless you're me, I kind of mix my mind maps and causal loops all into one. And you have a, a causal loop mind map or a mind map causal loop, whatever you want to call it. Right. So these are the first two that we have. Uh, another one here is Catwo. I have to admit, never heard of it. Uh, previously, before uh, we spoke to Shane uh, about this, I don't even know if cat woe is the correct way of pronouncing it. So I apologize for all those among you who know what it is, uh, how to pronounce this. It is a technique that provides a framework for defining and analyzing business stakeholder perspectives. And CATMO is a mnemonic. It stands for Customer Actor Transformation Worldview Owner and Environment, C-A-T-W-O-E. And we use that because in any change initiative, it's essential to investigate the perspective of these various stakeholders. Right. Uh, Shane also mentioned a few others. We're not going to go into detail here. Uh, visible systems, uh, methods such as system mapping, action learning, systems dynamics. These can help forecast and identify risks to the plan during the delivery. All right. So all of these techniques, you can actually do uh, a team exercise on this. So next time your team is stuck, on a complex problem, try to help them view it from a holistic point of view. So literally take them out of their usual environment, find a quiet meeting room or a virtual meeting room, and then do this type of exercise here to, to you know, change their thinking and bring, a, bring in a different angle here. Start with positioning themselves as the individual stakeholders to help the team understand the context of the problem that they are trying to solve. Then let them create something. Let them be creative by, by encouraging them to create a rich picture of the problem, right? So they can visualize the individual parts and how they behave together as a whole and how the individual stakeholders fit into that system. Yeah, so this method should help get everyone's creative juices flowing, and most importantly, help the team deliver a solution that really takes everything into consideration, right? If you if you think back of that rich picture, right, it, it's, it was beautifully drawn to start with, probably done by an artist, but, you know, if you just doodle around on a few flip charts next to each other, you'll come up with a great solution with a great rich picture that fits your needs and lets everybody think in to that direction and, and see not just the trees, but the forest as well. So what does this look like in practice? And before we get started here, again, you see that turquoise box there. Add your examples in the chat. For those of you who are joining me live on YouTube and Facebook today, please, um, if you see something, I, I want to know. How do you apply this in practice? What types of methods do you use in order to get yourself thinking more holistically about things? Please type them into the chat and we'll bring them up and we'll add on in addition to, the, uh, to what we have here. So in practice, right? You use analytics for uh, process mapping. So you use these analysis skills to accurately map business processes. You draw on technical expertise. You want to understand IT systems interactions, right? You're mapping data flows so that everyone is clear on how information moves throughout the whole system. And you will be listening to your teams and uh, accounting for perspective on how each job is accomplished or each concern is raised about the entire project delivery process, right? So overall, this principle, this is something that is really important during the solutions design. So you do this early on because unless you in understand 
how the business systems link together, you might miss something. And that uh, you might miss something that could make the system and the solution much better. So, so far, I uh, haven't seen anything in the chat yet. Uh, that means we covered it all. Wonderful. This is an all-encompassing lesson. Uh, nobody has anything to add. But I hope you have something to add in just a moment because we are now going on to our first sample exam question here taken from the PrepCast exam simulator. Here we go. A software development company has grown quickly and now employs five Scrum Masters to better coordinate activities and shared resources between the projects. The business transitioning from Scrum to SAFE, registered trademark, is an overarching project management framework. What strategy will most benefit the business in addressing the interdependencies between the projects? Is it A, hiring a program manager to ensure decision-making across the projects is centralized? Is it B, applying systems thinking by taking a holistic view of how projects in their part and their parts interact? C, ensuring that each project operates within a silo led by a dedicated Scrum Master? Or is it maybe D, having the Scrum Masters remove distractions by limiting communication between project teams? As always, I'm going to give you 15 seconds here. If you're watching this recorded, if you need more time, just press pause. Please go ahead, type A, B, C, or D into the chat on Facebook and YouTube. I'm getting the first results here. So we have a B, we have a B, we have another B, we have another B, we have another B. Uh, yeah, so it seems like B is winning. Uh, the answer, however, is C. No, just kidding. The answer is indeed B, everybody. Yes. I mean, we've been talking about holistics and systems thinking quite a bit. So this was uh, quite a, a relatively easy answer to find here because our minds have been so much into this particular topic here. All right. That's it for our look at the holistic thinking, and we are now moving up from managing to leading. So principle number six that we want to look at is leadership leading over managing. Um, yes, so leadership in the context of project management is different from leadership in other domains because of the relationship that the project manager has with the team, what we have with the team. Right. I, I often see myself as an equal to the team members, yet I also have to understand, no, 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 I'm, I'm just slightly above. I, I, I have to lead. I have to guide. Yes. And as an effective leader in this space, we must be much more facilitative. Right. So I, I see myself at the same level and just sometimes a little bit above early on when I have to lead, when I have to be in front of the team. But as soon as things happen, I, I need to go and stand behind the team. I have to help them. Right. With more use of a servant leadership style uh, than the traditional, uh, you know, the leader on a pedestal kind of a style. And so it's much more about influencing and inspiring people personally. I, I think that the facilitative leadership works really, really well, uh, especially now in our mix of virtual, hybrid, and in-person projects that we are running. Personally, to me, this means, please, do leave your ego at the door, right? Yes, they call me the project manager. Yes, they call me the project leader. But guess what? I'm not really doing any work on this project. All of you are doing the work. I want to facilitate. I want to make sure. I want to be your servant leader, right? I remove your impediments. I am behind you to be in front of you. I, I don't know if that makes any sense, but my job is to help you, the team, to be successful. That's where I am 
going with this, right? You do everything you can to support the people who work for you so that they can be successful, right? So that's what I say, but let's see what our expert says. This is Dr. Penny Plon. As project managers uh, don't typically have line management authority over the people in their teams, leadership is different. We need to get things done without line authority, and that means people following our lead of their own volition, right? And this is something that you and I must be working on almost daily. You, you, you can't just point into the direction and expect everyone to follow. You have to convey the mission and the vision so that everyone understands why we are going into a certain direction and that doing so makes sense to them, to me, to everybody on the team. And let me just quickly show you a graphic in regards to, you know, uh, th this, we don't really have the, uh, the authority, right? Because um, leadership uh, in project management is something that you both do as well as something you experience right you and i we have to we have to lead down right from, from an organizational perspective right from an we have to lead down we have to lead the teams to a certain extent we have to lead them but at the same time we have to keep them in front of and and remove their impediments and at the same time right we are also we're also getting led from our sponsors right but at at some point we have to help our sponsors as well. We have to lead our sponsors. We have to lead up. We have to explain to them why now we can't have it ready next week because, right? So we have to help them to become better leaders as well. Just as I hope that the people who report to us, that we learn from them and we become better leaders because of that. So leading up and leading down is definitely something that you want to consider as you are thinking about leadership in project management. Here's the difference, right? A lot has been written about the difference between leadership and management. And the main thing to be aware of, management is about tasks, while leadership is about people. Your project management skills, they will help you manage the work and your leadership skills will help you lead the team. So as a project manager, you are both leading and managing, often at the same time. You are responsible for managing and controlling the work here on the left and the project processes, but also for motivating and directing the team on the right. So while you need to be both a project manager and the project leader, it really helps to understand the difference between those two roles. So let's go through this quickly. We have a long preamble, I apologize. So uh, as a project manager, you direct the work, whereas a project leader, you lead the people. As a project manager, you schedule activities. And as a project leader, you guide people towards the vision. The project manager reports on what has happened in the past. The project leader, however, plans for changes that are coming down the road by talking to the sponsors and by understanding holistically where we are heading. The project manager takes tactical actions. The project leader foresees problems. The project manager develops others through team development exercises and all of that, whereas the project leader inspires others right? You can instantly tell these are two different roles, substantially different roles, you know, managing, guiding, the, 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 the process focus, whereas leadership is more on the vision, the people, getting people to do what they're supposed to do and, 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 and help them get to the finish line, right? And we do this simultaneously, almost at the same time. Well, yeah, that's what simultaneously means, Cornelius. All right. Uh, let's see. Once again, we have some examples for you. And I hope that uh, this time we got some last in, in the last time when I asked you, could we have some more examples? Somebody said this. You've covered it all. Thanks. <laughs> I hope you find a few. So here are some examples in the project context for you. 
helping team members understand the vision and goals and their role in delivery, leading by example, being the organizational culture that you want to see, right? You, you um, portray, you know, the, the, the leader, the type of person that we want to be on our project. And of course, mentoring your colleagues. Uh, and this is where, uh, you know, leading up and leading down comes in because you can also be mentoring your sponsors here. So as a project leader, you'll be doing leadership most of the time as you work on the project from picking up the project to making sure the customer gets what they need as you close it out. And leadership is a principle to apply at every step. This starts at the very beginning in the kickoff meeting and that ends, uh, ends at the very end when you hand over the final deliverables to the team who takes it on from here. Facilitative leadership, that is a style that you can learn and get better at with practice. And uh, a good thing about more facilitative styles of leadership in project management is that the project management models and, and how the rest of the team can step up, right? So if you're a facilitative leader, then others can join you and become leaders as well. And this is, by the way, not what I'm saying. This is what Penny, uh, our, our expert, said. And with each team member serving each other, success becomes more likely and the project journey is more enjoyable uh, with everybody learning along the way. Again, I'm not seeing anybody adding anything here on YouTube and Facebook, but please, if you can think of other examples of what leadership looks like in context in your projects, then please uh, do type it in. I'll bring it up uh, afterwards. You always lead, right? This is something that we have seen. Yes, you'll be doing leadership most of the time as you work on the project, from picking up uh, the project to making sure that the customer gets what they want as you close it out. Leadership is a principle to apply at every single step. Okay, and uh, we have somebody here, uh, Hans uh, Meulenbroek. Uh, importance is that the leader communicates in a team member manner. Yes, uh, as we have said, you know, nowadays leadership is not often top down, but leadership is on the same level, facilitative, helping your team members understand why we are here and why we are doing things. So thank you so much, Hans, for that additional comment there. Uh, yes. And uh, yeah. That's, that's pretty much it here for the review of our leadership approach. Now then, uh, the next exam sample questions, uh, question from our exam simulator. Here we go. After a few iterations, new features have been requested and added to the project backlog. Senior leadership has provided additional funding and approved a new project timeline. However, a team member mentions that the project charter is no longer in alignment with the updated project backlog. Hmm. What action should the agile leader take? I suppose this should read to resolve the issue. Is it A, ask the team member to revise the project charter and submit it to the project sponsor for approval? B, take ownership of the issue and work with the project sponsor to revise the project charter. C, capture the risk of misalignment between the project backlog and the charter in the risk register. Or D, empower the project team members to develop and implement their own project charter. Is it A, B, C, or D? You have 15 seconds. Those who watch it recorded can pause. Please type it into the chat box on YouTube and Facebook. Thank you. All right, so far I have just Dana, who's gone out on a limb. Here we go, Dana said D. Ah, we have another one coming in from Hans. Hans says B, so we have D versus B so far. Now then, uh, frankly, these are the two that make most sense 
here as the potential answer. We have Sheila who's also saying D. So if you are if you are flip flopping between B and D, you have already zoomed in into the two best answers here. It looks like D is winning here at the moment, right? Uh, B has got another vote here. Uh, D just got another one coming in. Ah, uh, yeah, all of the ones who are with D. I'm sorry to tell you, this time round it is B. Okay, and the reason why is this. One of the responsibilities of an agile leader is to shield the project team from distractions, right? So you want to keep the distraction of having a, an out-of-date project charter away from them, right? That's not their job, right? Here it becomes important to understand who owns the project charter, right? The project team does not own the project charter. Right. In, that means the agile leader, we must accept the responsibility and addressing the issue with the project sponsor and keeping the team focused on the development work. Right. And I think this is where the big differentiator comes in. If you've been thinking, well, it could be B, it could be D, the other two are, are obviously wrong. Right. And here it is important to really understand who issues the project charter, who owns the project charter, right? The project charter is issued and owned and signed by the project sponsor because the project sponsor, well, they open up their wallet and they pay for it, right? It's not the team that owns the project charter. Usually the project manager, sometimes even the project team, we work collaboratively on the project charter, but then it goes to the, the, the project sponsor and they then sign it and approve it, and now the project gets started. But in a situation like this where we're after the fact, right, it is owned by the project sponsor at this point, so we as the project team, we shouldn't be working on this. Instead, we should be working on doing the work on the project at this point, right? So as the Agile leader, you need to shield your team from this issue, go back to the project sponsor, you take the responsibility, you are now the servant leader for your project team, go to the sponsor, say, hey, this seems to be out of date. What do we do? And together with the project sponsor, you work on updating the project uh, charter so that the team can focus on what they need to focus on. Also, no, you know, uh, project charters, they're not typically revised. Right. In rare cases, when the project manager is replaced, yes, then a charter can be amended. And if the project is no longer aligned with the project charter, uh, like in this scenario, you know, you should ask yourself, is it time to cancel the project? We're doing something that is not aligned with the charter. Should we cancel this project? Right. That would be an appropriate question to answer. But look at our uh, question to ask, but look at our answer choices. We don't have that available, right? If A had been, you know, discuss whether or not this project should be canceled with the project sponsor, that, in my opinion, would be the best answer because that's what you should be doing. We're, we're working on a project that is misaligned with the project charter. Well, should we cancel it? That is the correct answer, uh, the question to ask, okay? But that's not here. We don't have that option as one of the answer choices. So out of the four answer choices that we have here, working with the sponsor to update it, that would be the next best thing to do. All right, enough of this uh, leadership. We are moving on to tailoring because, yeah, not, uh, you know, one size doesn't fit all, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, we have to tailor. Tailoring means choosing. It means choosing the right delivery approach based on organizational context, the team culture, maturity, and what it is that you are developing. When we consider an organization and their project management methodology, we usually see an internal evolution of adaptation of a broadly known methodology, right? And, and, this adaptation of a ready-made system of practices, techniques, and procedures and rules that you are using and, and as you are working on projects, that is a first step and an important step of tailoring. So in other words, you take 
something that's ready-made, you apply it to your organization and you say, well, we're taking this methodology here and this is what we do, this is how we use it, and this is how we manage our projects. That is the, the first steps, right? And this is actually, again, comes from our, uh, our export, uh, Bruno Morgante, and he believes there's often more that an organization could and should do to bring about a tailored solution for project delivery. Here's Bruno's quote. Um, Even when a methodology is tailored to fit the organization's needs, peculiarities, culture, and maturity, it is important to take it a step further and tailor the project management approach for each project, not just for the company, but for each project. Each project is unique and not all projects require every process deliverable and governments. Bruno believes that teams in organizations that prevent tailoring will tailor their projects anyway, but without any control. So if you are working in an organization and you have a project management methodology and you're just being told, follow this, right? No changes allowed. Well, guess what? You're going to do it anyway. That's that's pretty much uh, the, the essence of this. So because we're doing this anyway, might as well do it, okay? Um, and what works well for Bruno and, and his teams was creating a fast track approach with a simplified governance for particular types of projects, projects in their case that have low complexity and low budgets. Now, low complexity and low budget means different things for different people, right? A $1 million project in your industry could be a low budget project. To me, this is a humongously large project, right? So this is, again, you know, this is tailored to them. Uh, the team that worked on this, they identified a set of adaptive deliverables that were applicable only to specific projects. And this then lowered the burden of project managers and team administratively, allowing them to focus on delivering and not on creating all that paperwork, right? And um, tailoring is really something that you do naturally as you gain more experience because it's easier to make those uh, decisions, especially if there is a corporate framework in place that gives you guidance. So it's, it's not just like, here is our methodology, go ahead and, and adapt it to whatever needs you have. No, 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 adapt it, but here are some ideas and some guidelines in how you can adapt it. So if you ever work in a PMO, don't forget that step tell your project managers how they should be adapting and tailoring their uh, their methodologies or your methodology to their projects. Okay, let me give you a tailoring example. This is my own example, actually. This is something that I did. I was working for a large financial institution here in the USA, a bank, if you wish. And uh, I, I'm not kidding you, okay? Their project management methodology, I printed it. It was a whole, a whole ream of paper, that's 500 pages, double-sided, okay? So it's, it's a huge thing that they had. Um, it was very detailed. It was a lot of work to fill this in. Yeah, the, so you can see a stack of paper here, right? Uh, it was simply impossible for our environment, the place that we worked in, because we only had smallish projects, right? It doesn't, it doesn't really make sense. So I suggested to tailor this 500-page methodology, and I had a vision. I wanted to cut this down from 500 pages to a single page, one page only, okay? Oh, all right, so I needed to argue and explain why we don't need it the other 499 pages, right? So, um, as an example, right? So I created a table with the 500 
you know, there, there were various types of, of, of plans that you had to fill in. And so for each plan in the table, I explained why we don't need this, right? And, and I, I gave examples why it wasn't needed. For example, there is a whole uh, release plan where you define how software gets released from, you know, the development area into production. And our argument was, we don't need this. We have a fully functional automated software release plan. We don't have to fill this in. We, we, th this is part of our standard process. Why fill in 30 pages for something that is done automatically, right? So, and in this way, I whittled things down and I continued and I continued. And then in the end, uh, we submitted our newly tailored method to corporate and they approved it. And uh, yeah, you're probably asking, did you get it back down to a page? No, I totally failed. It was one page and a third. <laughs> I. If I had used smaller font, if I had, you know, if I had made it less space, but you still have to be able to use this thing, right? So, yeah, it was one page and a little bit. But in the end, you know, going from 500 pages down to that, that is what I call tailoring, right? Adapt a project management methodology to your environment. And that's what this is all about. Okay, some areas for tailoring. And again, Please do add your examples in the chat. So far, nobody's played along today. I'm hoping you'll get some, get some ideas from you here today. So if you're just starting out or you haven't had the opportunity to tailor your processes, uh, these are some ways in which you might do that. So review the change management process to ensure that it fits your purpose, the purpose of your project, and making tweaks to the approach that uh, as they are necessary. Ensure that... Everyone understands the approach, processes, and methodologies in use and make sure that there are regular discussions about how the work is going and listening to improvements for how processes could be improved. And last but not least, do take note of this in, in lessons learned. Write it down as a reference for future project managers who may be looking at your templates, right? Why did you uh, update this template? Why did you change things? Yes, and once again, we have silence here in the chat. Nobody has anything to add. Well, in that case, let, let me say one more thing here, and that's uh, this here. Tailoring is iterative. Right. At the beginning of your project, you'll make some tailoring choices about how to do the work uh, with input from your team, obviously. And th that's not the only time that you need to be tailoring uh, when it's important in practice, because as you work through the project, you may learn more about how to improve performance and productivity. And that's when you want to do a little bit more tailoring, switching things up so the team can continue to perform to their very best uh, ability here. So as a, as a picture, I have chosen the plan, do, check, act cycle. But based on what I've said, you've, for those of you who know Agile a little, you recognize this, right? In Agile, tailoring, retrospectives, changing the way you do things. This is this is just the nature of, of how we manage our projects. So, but even if you are in a plan-driven environment, you should continue to review things and learn from phase to phase and change things, improve things, not as quickly as you do in an agile environment, but you cannot be stagnant. If something isn't working, why keep doing it, right? That is just detrimental for the project. All right. And now we come to the audience participation part where we have another PMP exam sample question taken from pmexamsimulator.com. A project is initiated to deliver a solution comprised of several software modules. Each module represents a subset of the total solution and can be developed and released independently. The customer's main focus is on the speed of delivery. What is the best strategy for the project manager to employ? A, utilize a incremental project life cycle with multiple deliveries. B, employ a predictive approach with a single phase 
project. C, select the hybrid approach and release all modules in a single delivery. And, or is it D, outsource the development of each module to a different vendor. Looking forward to your answers here in the chat, A, B, C, or D, for those who are live. If you need more time, press pause. I'll give you 15 seconds. All right, I'm getting the first answers here. We have an A from Raymar, Raymond. We have another A. We have another A. We have another A. A seems to be winning. Anyone else? Any other A's? Anybody going for B, C, or D? No? Ah, uh, C or A. Right. So, Nicole, we have C or A. A, we have Lee and, and Dana with their A's. Yes, okay. So A is winning. So Nicole, you were right. C, it is C or A. It is in fact uh, A. Utilize an incremental project lifecycle with multiple deliveries. And so an incremental approach can be beneficial when the project needs to be optimized for speed of delivery. In this case, each module would represent an increment of the total solution and can be released once it has been completed, allowing the customer to begin receiving value as soon as possible, right? And uh, since each of these modules can be developed and shipped uh, independently, the customer can receive value very early on. Well, pretty much as soon as the first module is released, right? And more value is delivered with each subsequent release. And let me just tell you that what we are doing here with the recording of our prep cost training course, we're doing exactly the same thing. Right. So this new lesson, currently recording it, as soon as we are done, we're going to finish it, edit it, get it ready for release to our students. Right. So we are also doing incremental release here, lesson by lesson. OK, so the out of the available choices, using the incremental product lifecycle with multiple deliveries would be the best strategy for us as project managers to employ because it allows us you know to deliver the value very very early on so you hear me say value a few times so th this particular question is not just about tailoring right it is about tailoring and understanding how to change your project and make it fit purpose but it's also about the principle of delivering value early on right and it's a knowledge-based question as well. Which of these options here do you take? Which of these options allows you to tailor it towards value delivery and, and answer the scenario appropriately? What is the best thing you can do? So not every question is just about a single principle, about a single knowledge. Well, this is holistic thinking, right? Everything fits into each other. All right, this is it. Uh, oops, sorry, <laughs> going a bit too quickly here. So this is it for that question. We are moving on from tailoring to quality. Yes, uh, somebody said quality is free and doing things right the first time. That is when quality is free. I think we're getting back to the quality is free statement in just a little bit. If you know who said quality is free, type it in the chat. Uh, otherwise, I'll let you know later on. So, quality should be built into processes and its results because uh, stakeholders expect to get an end result that is fit for purpose and meets their needs. And that is an important thing to remember, right? Quality is it's fit for purpose and uh, what it needs, right? And this is also the statement that we have here from Gabriel Mausner-Schauten, our expert today, or for this particular principle, project management is about creating value. And without quality, the project team 
effort is wasted and no value is created. Uh, just imagine if I delivered something to you that you'd go, yeah, that, that's what I asked for, but it breaks after the first use, so it's useless to me. Right? It has no value because the quality isn't there of what you have delivered, right? And uh, so um, in the most basic sense, quality means that the end product or service meets the customer's needs, not more and really not less. And Dana is absolutely right. Philip Crosby said, quality is free. I'll explain to you why quality is free in a little bit here. All right, so when do you define quality standards, right? So our expert, Gabriel, says typically quality standards, they are defined in the initiation or at the latest in the planning stage. And that is why the first two dots here on this timeline are green and the others are red, right? So together with the customer, we as the project team, uh, uh, we develop quality standards and we discuss how to measure quality throughout the project management process, right? And she likes to make the quality discussion part of her regular team meetings as well and use various retrospectives to dig deeper if a quality challenge exists, yeah? And then during the execution, uh, monitoring, controlling files, that is when you want to measure the in process quality. So in other words, in, in the first two dots here, initiation and planning, you define what quality is. And then during execution, monitoring, closing, you measure, you measure, you make sure, did we achieve what we had originally set as our quality standards, right? And this is critical since it allows us to correct course and avoid having a finished product or service that doesn't meet the quality expectations that we have set up at the beginning. All right, so this is kind of the traditional way at looking at quality within a project. But huh, the definition of quality is evolving. Right, And she has seen firsthand uh, how a focus on the principle of quality makes a difference in project success. In our fast-moving world, she's also witnessed that quality standards evolve throughout the project life cycle. This can be part of a project scope refinement by the customer, key stakeholders, and the project team. And the other consideration for quality is that it is important to understand how quality is defined. The notion of quality is becoming a lot more multifaceted and incorporates more of the how we achieve our project outcomes. There is a lot more emphasis on team effectiveness, inclusive teams, and paying attention to our environmental footprint right imagine the uh, the you know the, the public relations disaster if you developed a project that was just spewing out smoke all the time right that is a very important thing to consider that to me these days is quality is it environmentally friendly right so that is definitely something to keep in mind the definition of quality needs to be tailored to your project, right? There we go again, bringing two of these into the same way. All right, so let's apply the quality principle here and uh, talk a little bit about what this means in practice. Again, if you have any examples, I'll take them in the chat from you. So yes, um, something you could look out for or adopt in your environment are, are these for here, uh, robust approaches to how quality management will be undertaken and follow through on that, right? Not just having those processes, but making sure that they're followed. Um, uh, talking to stakeholders and the team about what quality work is and how we will be measuring it, right? What, what do we feel quality is? How do we define quality don't care about what the other projects are saying we need to have our own definition of quality and 
ensuring that the team members have the right and sufficient tools and resources that are needed to do the job well. And do not allow them to cut corners, right? If you don't give them the tools and the money and the resources, they will start to cut corners, which means quality is going to be, um, is going to be, well, just going down. Um, it's also important the that quality should be built into the project from the very beginning by making sure that uh, ways of working encourages quality result, right? But um, there is typically more emphasis on quality as soon as you start producing deliverables because often for our stakeholders, it, quality means I like what I get. Right, your deliverable works for me. To them, that's quality. That, that in, in the end, you know, that that is the definition, uh, the basic definition of quality. So, for us as a project team, quality could mean something else, and, and how we build it. We're an inclusive team. Everybody gets their say. That's that's part of of quality, right? We make sure that it is environmentally friendly. But in the end, if the customer goes uh, useless thing you've delivered, then you know we haven't delivered quality. So. The, all of that has to be uh, taken into consideration, right? So make sure that you plan time to do quality activities and don't try to deliver earlier by skimping on quality. And now we get to this here. Do it right the first time, derft, and quality is free. Now, um, my interpretation of what Philip Crosby meant uh, by quality is free is this. If you build quality into your processes, and you do this from the very beginning, right? You have a quality process. You go through this, and since quality is always at our forefront, well, we're going to be doing things right the first time. We're not going to sort of yeah, wishy-washy do something and then at the end we have something, yeah, okay, it wasn't right. Let's repeat it. Let's fix it. Let's go back. Right? All of these feedback loops, they cost time, they cost money, they cost resources, and that's where you know the, the budget explosion happens. If you do it right the first time, if you build quality into your processes, yes, it'll cost you at the beginning, but then... Never again, because you will deliver quality at the very first time you give me something, right? We hand something over to the customer. It's like, wow, yeah, this is exactly what I wanted. Superb. You have achieved the quality standard I was hoping for. You don't have to go back. You don't have to go fix it. So there is no additional cost in getting whatever you delivered ready and getting it to the quality standard that the customer was expecting. So quality is free in the broad sense. All right. We're moving on again to a sample exam question from the exam simulator. Here it is. The project charter has just been approved and a scrum team has been assigned to the project. The agile leader wants to ensure the appropriate quality of the project deliverables. Of the following, which should the agile leader do first? Is it A, determine the acceptance criteria by reviewing the detailed requirements outlined in the project charter? Is it B, create a work breakdown structure, that's a WBS, by decomposing the work down to the work package level? Is it C, conduct a requirements gathering meeting with relevant stakeholders and determine acceptance criteria? Or is it D, develop a graphical representation of the logical relationships among the various project activities, A, B, C, or D. Once again, I'll give you 15 seconds, and I'm looking forward to your answers here in the chat.
Okay, so I'm getting the first answers coming in here, but believe it or not, I'm going to go one slide back before we reveal, actually, no, we're going to go two slides back here before we reveal the correct answer because 89 Nivi said maintaining a quality KPI on the project can be one way to embed within the project. Absolutely. If you define how you're going to measure quality, then you know exactly what quality should look like. And then those key performance indicators, you can measure them later on. That is definitely a way of making sure that you keep an eye on quality. And now let's go back forward again here to the question. Uh, we get a lot of, of a little bit of everything today here in this one. We have D, we have C, we have A or C, 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 D, C, C, C. All right. C seems to be winning. And it is indeed the letter C as in Charles. Yeah. Uh, once the product charter has been approved, one of the first objectives of us leaders is to determine the project requirements and document the acceptance criteria from which we derive quality needs. Right. So this is this is very similar to what we just saw here from 89 uh, Nivi, the, the quality KPIs. Right. Uh, a requirement gatherings meeting is, is one method of determining the requirements that in turn will then influence uh, the remainder of the project. Right. So, yes, we have learned as project leaders, we should build quality into the processes and into the deliverables. Right. And once the product charter has been approved, one of the first activities is indeed to determine determine these requirements, these acceptance criteria, and they will influence the remainder of the project planning, the rest of the project. And uh, these can be derived from stakeholders, contracts, organizational policies, standards, regulatory bodies, uh, you name it, right? So as you are doing the, uh, the, this gathering, it's not just the people attending and helping, you know, you have to look into do we have a contract? Does the contract say anything about it? Does the charter, does the project management plan do the, everything, right? Do we have any external bodies, the government, that tells us what quality means and what quality has to look like as part of the deliverables that we give, right? So, uh, therefore, uh, out of the choices, conducting a requirements gathering meeting with the relevant stakeholders, this is the best answer to the questions asked. Right. And I say this every time that we come to the last question here. If you feel that, oh man, those four questions, they were really easy, right? I immediately knew what the answers were. Well, don't forget, right? We just talked about quality and, and then we give you a quality question. We talk about leadership, we give you a leadership question. Of course, you know, your mind is in that space and in that thinking. But once you're on the real PMP exam and you've already answered 106 questions and then you come to this question here, you have no idea where you are in the process and, and what the scenario is and everything starts sounding the same, right? So questions like this, even though relatively easy, may become very, very hard, uh, you know, in the during the heat of things on your project. Before we close things out, uh, please don't forget to check out our PrepCast training at pmprepcast.com or the PrepCast exam simulator at pmexam simulator.com. One will give you all the knowledge and experience, not experience, the knowledge, uh, skills, tools, and techniques you need. And the other one will allow you to test yourself on many, many exam sample questions. Right. We're coming to the take action here. And the take action, just like last time in the in the first where we looked at the first four of these principles it's a little bit of a duh i could have thought of this myself but just to make it clear you want to get a copy of the pinbook guide seventh edition pdf from pmi you want to download it you can get it if you are a member pmprepcast.com slash pinbook dl as in pinbook download dl and then review principles five to eight a very quick read usually they're you know one to two pages some are three pages in length so this is where you want to go you also want to look for the list of these 10 reference books that i talked about very early on they are on the pmi website we have provided the link in the chat here as well i'm sorry i don't have it on this slide 
here. There's one more thing that I want you to do. Maybe not 100% uh, exam relevant, but this here is an interview that I did with Jeff Kissinger uh, on leading projects without authority. Visit pm-podcast.com slash 406. It's a free interview that you can look. And in this interview, we look at what project managers can do successfully to deliver their projects, even in a situation where we have little or no authority over all the people that work on our projects. You know, this is leadership in action right? It supports the, your leadership experience that you need for the uh, for the exam, sort of in a roundabout way. It, it supports everything about team development in a roundabout way. So it's a good way of looking at it. How does this work in context? Maybe, you know, like I said, not 100% exam relevant, but it helps you to, to embed things. A little bit of systems thinking there, you know, go outside to look at something else to get a better picture of your whole system. The whole system, which in this case is the PMP exam, obviously. Right. And then we want to close with our usual takeaways. Right. There are really only two, you know, in addition to the four principles that we have looked at today. First of all, please don't forget the PMBOK guide is not the PMP exam. Yes, it is an important document that you definitely must know, must know its contents, but it is not the PMP exam. There are nine other references that, uh, that you need to know or that are used for the PMP exam. The knowledge comes from, you know, uh, watching lessons, taking a course, right? And Exam questions are mapped to two out of 10 reference books, and it is quite possible that the PIMBOK guide is not one of those two references, especially if we are talking about agile questions, right? And with this broken record, yes, I do sound like a broken record. I repeat this almost every time uh, about the PIMBOK guide not being uh, the PMP exam. With that out of the way, thank you once again for joining me today uh, for participating in our live stream here and for joining me in answering those PMP exam sample questions. Thank you again. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Until next time, everybody. But before you go, don't forget, this lesson is part of a series which helps you to be better prepared for your PMP exam. Please do visit pmprepcast.com slash more to watch all of them.